Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a junior doctor working in Cambridge. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking you through a day in the life on my general surgery placement, which is what I'm currently doing. These events happened on a random Friday a couple of weeks ago where I was thinking it would be really nice to kind of vlog this day because this is like what a normal day is like. But obviously hospitals are weird about you filming on site because of confidentiality and consent issues and all that stuff. So instead, I just wrote down a list of everything that I did that day and I'm just gonna talk you through it and try and paint a picture of what it's like being a first year junior doctor on a general surgery placement. So I'm with the upper GI gastrointestinal team and I'll just start by telling you a little bit about what the specialty does and then we'll go on to kind of a day in the life. So the upper GI team covers the upper gastrointestinal system. So everything from the esophagus down to the stomach the duodenum, jejunum, and the small intestine is covered by us, whereas the large intestine, the colon, and the rectum is covered by the colorectal team. So some of the problems we deal with are esophageal and gastric cancers, for which we can do esophagectomies and gastrectomies. Obviously, me as a, as a junior doctor, I don't physically do those operations. Those are done by the consultants and by the registrars who are actually training in general surgery. What we as the junior doctors, as the foundation doctors, tend to do is that we manage the medical problems of the patients who are under the, under the surgical team. So for example, if a patient needs fluids prescribed or if a patient randomly becomes unwell, we are the ones who are kind of the first responders to that scene because usually the consultants and the registrars are in theater doing the operations. Other things we deal with, we sometimes get small bowel obstruction. Occasionally we do appendicitis and appendectomies. Uh, we deal with the gallbladder. So if someone's got gallstones, we might take out their gallbladder. Um, so it's those sorts of problems that are dealt with by the general surgery team or upper GI. Now in terms of the structure of the day, um, like in most medical and surgical specialties, we start off with a ward round. The semi-annoying thing about being on surgery is that these ward rounds start at half past seven in the morning. This means I have to get up at half past six which you kind of get used to after a while. And actually today I have a day off, but I got up at half past six naturally anyway, because you know, the whole body clock thing. Anyway, so we get into work at half past seven, we print off the patient lists, because even though we have an entirely electronic system, it's still useful to have a printed off list where you can just sit around a table and go through what needs to be done for each patient. So usually for the first 20 minutes or half an hour, we get together with the consultants, the registrar, the rest of the team, and we figure out what we need to do for each patient. So we might go down the list and be like, oh, Mr. Smith, he's day, day 12 post esophagectomy, you know, he, uh, as in he had his esophagus removed 12 days ago. He's now doing well and we're hoping to get him home tomorrow. And then some people, someone writes home tomorrow. We might be like, oh, Mrs. Mrs. What's her face has a small bowel obstruction. Let's give her some gastrographin, which is like a, an oral contrast agent that helps the bowels get, move a little bit more. And then we'll do an X-ray six hours after that to see if the bowel obstruction has resolved. So after about half an hour of running through the patients and blitzing through what's wrong with them, we then split up and usually one of the juniors goes with one of the consultants and we see half the patients and then the other junior goes with the other consultant and sees the other half of the patients. And then when we see the patient, it's about getting their notes up on the system. Um, it's quite handy because I've got the iPad with me so I can just log into our computer system there and then and we, we can therefore save time. I don't have to wait to grab one of those, you know, computer on wheels and log into the system and wait for it to load and all that stuff. So that's quite handy on the iPad. And when we're seeing the patients, we're doing things like checking their vital signs. So, you know, overnight, did they spike a temperature? Did their heart rate go dangerously low? Anything like that. We're looking at their blood tests. Most patients that we're looking after have blood tests on a fairly regular basis, often daily. So we look at their bloods and make sure there's nothing disastrously wrong with them. And we're talking to the patient, asking them how they're feeling, if they've got any pain, that sort of stuff. And we're trying to move them along in their journey and try and discharge them in a safe fashion. And often when we see patients, we, we, we would then generate some jobs. So for example, if a patient was complaining of continuing abdominal pain and the consultant would examine them and think, okay, I'm not happy with this, they might say, okay, let's get a CT scan for this patient because we're querying, I don't know, appendicitis or something. Um, and then I would write down on the iPad, on my iPad, CT scan for the patient, and I'd also put it in the patient notes electronically. But it's useful to have these two copies because you don't want to then have to log into every single patient's notes to get a list of your jobs. So you put the jobs list on the patient's notes, but then you also have your own separate list on the side, which I use the app Good Notes for these days. Anyway, so we do the ward round, we walk around the hospital, and this usually takes an hour or two. We've seen every patient at this point, we've looked at all the bloods, we've made sure they're fine, and we have generated this random list of jobs. It's not random, it is a very uh, reasonable list of jobs that we have to do to try and safely discharge everyone. So that's pretty standard so far. Um, but the thing that I really like about the surgery placement is that it's a lot more, there's a lot more stuff to do than there was on my previous medicine placements. And I feel like I'm constantly having to juggle things and to triage what's really important versus what versus what's not that important and therefore prioritizing my to-do list. So it's all well and good having this list of jobs, but the problem is, it's not really a problem, it's a, it's a good thing to do, is that we carry a bleep and that bleep goes off 
a lot of times throughout the day when stuff happens that we weren't expecting. So for example, a nurse might call us because a patient's become unwell. We might get called by the pharmacy or by the pharmacist because there's an error in one of our discharge summaries or uh, you know, list of drugs that the patient has to take. All these sorts of things can happen. So we as the bleep holders, as the junior doctors holding the bleep, have to be prepared for anything that happens when the bleep goes off. So here is a list of things that um, I had to do on that particular day. And so the ward round finished at around 11 a.m. On that day, we had 33 patients. That's a bit more on the high side. We, we can usually manage very nicely with about 20, 25, but 10 of them were going home that day. So therefore, me and the other junior doctor, Joe, we had to do 10 discharge letters and 10 what's called TTOs, which means to take out, which means prescribing a list of medications that the patient needs to go home with. Now this is sometimes simple. Let's say you have a 25 year old person who has come in because of appendicitis. They had their appendix removed and now they're going home. It's not that hard writing a discharge letter. A discharge letter is where you tell the GP, hey, look, hi, hi, hello doctor, uh, Mr. Mr. Tom whatever Jones came into hospital on the 8th of May, 2019 with appendicitis. We did an appendicectomy. <laughs> he recovered well. <laughs> there's no routine follow-up required. That's like a three-line discharge letter and apparently GPs appreciate it, when, appreciate it when you're brief about that sort of stuff. And a 25-year-old is unlikely to be on any regular medications, so you don't really have to do anything for their drugs list. But what if they're like 85 years old or actually more realistically, what if they're 65 and they've got gastric cancer and they've, they've had their stomach removed and they've been put on a load of new painkillers for it and they've been started on a load of low molecular weight heparin injections to reduce their risk of, their risk of a blood clot forming in the 28 days post-operative period. And also they've come in with a ton of medications and you have to ch change some of them. At that point, it becomes a bit of a chore and something you actually have to think about to do the discharge letter and to do the drugs list. So the discharge letter is where you explain to the GP what happened in hospital and if there were any complications and how we dealt with those complications. So often, you know, if we have patients who are there for two or three weeks, it will take 20 minutes to half an hour to actually figure out going through the notes what was wrong with them and to turn it into a decent discharge letter that a GP would be happy with. And then you have to look at all the drugs and see like, okay, you know, do I want to send them home with codeine or morphine or meptazanol or what sort of painkillers do I want to send them home with? How many days of you know, heparin injections should I prescribe them based on when they had their operation and what sort of operation they had. There's quite a lot to think about. Some patients might be on a drug called warfarin for something called atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat. Warfarin thins the blood, but sometimes we stop the warfarin before their surgery. And so we have to think about how we change the dose to restart them on the warfarin. All of these various things have to be done. So on this random Friday, we had 10 different discharges to do. About half of them were fairly simple, but the other half were kind of complex. And so me and Joe split the workload between us and tried to bash through them. Uh, as efficiently as we could while obviously, you know, being safe about it because discharge letters are important and the drugs that people take home are also very important and a big source of uh, potential errors can happen due to mistakes on this on this drug chart that people take home with them. Anyway, so um, while we're doing these discharges, we've got a few other routine jobs to do. So for example, we have three ultrasound scans to organize. Uh, we like to do ultrasounds for people with uh, cholecystitis or people with biliary colic. So essentially gallstones in the gallbladder that are causing pain and we like to do an ultrasound to look at the neck of the gallbladder to see if there's any stones in there. But anyway, we had these three ultrasound scans to organize and organizing an ultrasound scan you would think it's easy because normally for, like, for something like a CT scan, you just phone up the radiologist and you explain that, hey, look, I've got the patient. This is what we think the diagnosis is. Can we do a CT scan, please? And more often than not, they'd be like, yeah, sure, that sounds reasonable, go for it. Especially because we're on a surgical ward and therefore most of the things we're looking for are surgical problems that can be picked up on a CT scan. But when it comes to ultrasound scans, because there's not that many slots for ultrasound, you have to walk literally about three quarters of a mile all the way to the ultrasound department have to wait to speak to a radiologist who might be in the middle of scanning patients because they always have ultrasounds to be doing and sort of try and convince them to prioritize your ultrasound scans based on everything else in their in their to-do list so you have to really be prepared you've got to really you have to really have a story and you have to and you have to understand how urgent each specific request is and the radiologists are usually very nice and very reasonable and kind of have a chat with them and they're very experienced doctors far more experienced than I am and so they ask questions and I'm like ah oh, that's a good question. I should probably know the answer to that. And then we try and go on the computer system and work it out. So it's quite a fun little thing to do, but it just takes a lot of time for one of us to physically walk all the way across the hospital, speak to a radiologist and try and book these ultrasound scans to happen at the right time. The other routine job that we had to do was we had to refer one of the patients to gynecology because we thought they might have an abdominal problem, but actually the CTs showed some kind of ovarian cyst. And we didn't think that the ovarian cyst would be a big deal, but it's a sort of problem that you wanna at least call gynecology about and say, hey, look, this patient's got abdominal pain. We couldn't find anything on the CT, but they have incidentally an enlarged ovary on the left-hand side. 
would you like us to do anything about it? Would you like to come and see the patient? So that, that had to be done. And then we also had a patient who had come into hospital with some kind of abdominal problem. We weren't sure what it was. Uh, we thought it was probably bowel obstruction. And then maybe it had even perforated. A perforated bowel is a really, really, really bad thing. You have all of the bowel contents leaking into your abdomen. And you know if that's not dealt with, it's gonna cause you to get an infection and die. Um, so that is a surgical emergency. They get rushed to theater immediately and the abdomen gets cleared out of all the crap that's gone from the bowel into the abdomen and then it gets sewn back up. But if someone is very old and very frail and are unlikely to survive emergency surgery, it then becomes a point of saying, okay, I guess we have to manage this conservatively and keep them comfortable. Um, and so we had a patient who we suspected had a bowel perforation, but there was no way that this patient was gonna survive surgery. And so it became a case of referring to the palliative care team and asking them for their opinion and explaining to the patient in like a nice way that we're very sorry, but there's, there's nothing really we can do. Um, I didn't have to have that conversation, thankfully. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I would have done well with it. Um, the consultant was there, so he had that conversation uh, with the patient. But, with the, but we as the junior doctors then had to speak to the palliative care team, the cardiology team, and see if there was anything else that we could do to, to make this patient's final few days a bit more comfortable. So that was another routine thing. And then while we're organizing these 10 discharge letters, these three ultrasound scans and this referral to palliative care team, we're getting a lot more bleeps from nurses across the hospital who are looking after our patients. So for example, um, one thing is that when we discharge patients on uh, controlled drugs like morphine uh, and oxycodone, we have to print off a form on the system and physically sign it because controlled drugs have a lot more regulation behind their use. And that's fine, like I can appreciate why it happens, but it's a little bit annoying when you're sitting in, a, in an office uh, that's on one side of the hospital trying to do your discharge letters, and then you get called about the patient that you've done the discharge for that's literally a mile away, well not a mile away, more like a kilometer away on the other side of the hospital because you have to print off their controlled drug form. And then that involves, okay, being like, right, this, this this piece of paper is delaying this patient's discharge. I've, I've just got to go. I've got to sign this form physically and I've got to give it to the pharmacy. So then we do that. There was another patient as well who I got bleeped about while I was on the way to do one of these uh, controlled drugs form. And it was a nurse saying, oh, we've got a patient who we're trying to discharge home, but they're a Jehovah's Witness, which means they're not going to consent to any kind of blood transfusion. And they also don't want to be resuscitated. So they've got a DNAR, do not attempt res resuscitation in place. They've got it in place in the hospital and in the community, and that's all well and good. But actually, in order to get the patient home, they have to go in an ambulance because they don't have their own transport. And the ambulance crew won't take them unless they physically have a Jehovah's Witness kind of ambulance, do not receive a resuscitate form signed. Because otherwise, what if the patient goes into cardiac arrest in the ambulance? Like, they're not legally allowed to not do anything to them unless they have a physically signed form that explains that they're a Jehovah's Witness and they don't want resuscitation. So then after doing this controlled drug form, I went across to the other kind of, kind of middle way in the hospital to try and figure out how to sign one of these forms because I'd never done one of these before, but the nurses were nice about it. They explained how to do it, filled out the right details, signed the form, gave it to the patient. Ambulance crew came, picked them up, took them home. While this was happening, I got a few more bleeps. So um, one of them was about a patient who died on a ward a few days prior. And anytime a patient dies, they have to have a death certificate done. And this death certificate explains why they died, you know, like the causes of death. And if there was anything, and, and if you don't know what the cause of death is, or if there are certain other conditions that are met, then they have to be referred to Her Majesty's coroner. Uh, and the coroner is like a, a service, I think it's, it's run by lawyers, and they are employed by the state to make sure that when people die, that we know why they died and that we know that there was, no, there was no foul play that could have led to their death. So unfortunately for this patient, because they died within 24 hours of being in hospital, you know, they, they were gonna die anyway. They had a life-threatening problem that we couldn't cure with surgery. But because they died within 24 hours, this is the sort of problem that has to be referred to the coroner by default. And so we need to do a death certificate for this patient, but then we also had to phone up the coroner's office and say, hey, look, this is a situation. And then they asked a load of other questions about exactly why the patient came into hospital, who saw them, blah, blah, blah. And ultimately said, yeah, that sounds fine. Feel free to issue the death certificate. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things that we have to do. And again, we can appreciate why it has to be done. But when you're in the middle of doing all these, all these other things, it just adds to the list of, oh, this is a bit of admin that I have to do because it's a legal requirement to phone up the coroner for patients that have died within 24 hours of admission. Okay, cool, I'll do that. Um, so 
at this point, these jobs are starting to pile up and we're slowly getting through the list and it's nice because there's two of us and we're kind of sharing the workload. Uh, but at 1 p.m., it was a Friday, so we had our mandatory teaching every every Friday up from one till two, all the F1 junior doctors get together and we have a teaching session and that's a requirement for our kind of educational portfolio thing. So we had to go to that, which means we couldn't do any any jobs on the ward for that hour. Um, about, about 2 p.m. immediately after, there was a patient who was becoming quite unwell and uh, once we'd assessed the patient, we decided that they'd had to ha that, that we wanted to do a venous blood gas. And a venous blood gas is a very quick and easy way of doing a blood test to see if there are if there's anything seriously wrong with the patients. Well, with with the patient, so we can look at something called lactate, which is a marker of anaerobic respiration. If that's high, that's a sign of an unwell patient. And we can look at their electrolytes like sodium and potassium to see if those are deranged. And we can look at their hemoglobin, which is basically the amount of blood cells they've got in their body to see if they've got a bleed from anywhere. So we wanted to do a VBG, a venous blood gas, and normally nurses can do venous blood gases, which means it frees up our time as doctors to do the other stuff we have to do. But unfortunately on this particular ward, there were no nurses that were available and trained to do a VBG. And so after seeing the patient and assessing the patient, we did one of the VBGs ourselves. We went, we went across the hospital to the VBG machine, put in the code, put in your password, you sort of inject the blood into the machine and it gives you a printout of the results and then that's quite helpful. And then because we noticed that there was a drop in the patient's hemoglobin, we thought they might need a blood transfusion. So this involved phoning up our consultant uh, who was on call and saying, hey, look, this patient's hemoglobin's dropped down to 74. We don't think there are any signs of bleeding based on the examination, based on the history. And they had a CT scan yesterday that showed no signs of bleeding. But do you think we should do a transfusion anyway? The consultant was like, yeah, okay, let's transfuse two units. But then whenever you do a blood transfusion, you have to take another blood sample from the patient to you know, check the blood type and the antibodies against it because you don't want to have a blood transfusion reaction. And again, no nurses were available to actually take that blood, which they normally do. And so we had to go back to the patient, be sorry, we have to do another blood test because we're going to do a transfusion. So we took another blood sample. Blood transfusion samples are called group and screens. And those are kind of weird as well because there's all sorts of regulations around them because a blood transfusion reaction is a very, very, very terrible thing that can kill people. And so there's all sorts of checks in place at the doctor level and at the laboratory level to make sure that the right patient's blood gets transfused into the right patient. But that involves kind of labeling a thing out by labeling a format by hand. You can't just print out a label and slap it on there. You have to fill everything out by hand, explain why you're requesting it, then request it on the system, and then physically take the blood sample down to the lab, which is another sort of five minute walk, and say, hey, can you process this urgently? We need to do a blood transfusion. So there's all these, all these various things. And the interesting thing about this is that very little of the day-to-day -day stuff of being a doctor actually requires an extensive amount of knowledge from medical school. Like I often speak to students who are very worried that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not top of my year or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just about scraping through my exams or I'm, I'm not doing that well. Does that mean I'm going to be a bad doctor? And no, not necessarily. Um, a lot of it is about like the vast majority of it is about being organized and being efficient and being quick at doing stuff. Um, very little of it is based on, based on having a knowledge, a knowledge of, of medical school topics. Um, it's obviously important to be able to recognize emergencies and to deal with emergencies there and then and to be able to ask for help but like no one really cares whether you may you've memorized the you know the Krebs cycle or if you know every little detail of some hematological malignancy that you're never going to come across what matters is that you've got the basics down and that you know when to ask for help and that you're organized and that you have decent communication skills when you're talking to families and to relatives and stuff like that so that was something that kind of surprised me about being a doctor like almost anyone can do it it's not that hard being a doctor um, and this whole culture of medical school admissions is very much based on the, oh, you have to be absolutely amazing to get into medical school because you need amazing grades because it's so, so hard. But it, but it's not that hard. It's, it's very, very doable. The content is interesting. And yeah, to be a good doctor, you don't have to know every, everything in the textbook. And I think we can become too fixated on knowing everything in the textbook and too fixated on competing against other people in our year to try and get that top prize. When really, you know, being a doctor is about being able to have a to-do list being able to take things off appropriately, being able to take blood in an efficient fashion when you have to, being able to walk quickly across the hospital, being able to phone up a specialty and say, hey, what's going on? And very occasionally to be able to deal with an unwell patient. But even then you're dealing with an unwell, unwell patient, you're following your standard A, B, C, D, E approach. You're doing a systematic thing. You're not needing to recall knowledge. Like it's, it's, it's gonna be a bad thing if you're in the middle of an emergency in a resuscitation scenario and you're having to remember the dose of adrenaline that you give to someone because the, the system and like the crash trolley is designed in a way that you don't have to remember this. It will physically tell you and give you a syringe that is already made out to the right dose of adrenaline. So you don't need to 
worry about memorizing those things. Like adrenaline is probably a bad example. It is very useful to know exactly what the dose of adrenaline is just in case there are circumstances where that you haven't got an ideal scenario going on. But for things like memorizing other kind of drug doses, memorizing mechanisms of action, memorizing interactions, in a way in this day and age when everything about every drug is accessible on your smartphone, you don't need to memorize a lot of stuff. You don't need to know it off the top of your head. And in fact, having the, having the confidence slash arrogance that you just know things off the top of your head is one of the ways that people sometimes make mistakes because, you know, you think you know the dose of a drug, but you might have got a number wrong. Like, how long does it take to just look it up on your phone? It takes about five seconds. There's the official BNF, the British National Formulary app. You can just look at every hospital has their own guidelines about different drugs as well. So being a doctor is not really about the stuff you know. It's about being organized, being systematic, following the structures, following the guidelines, and being able to ask for help when, you, when necessary. So overall, this was a really fun day. I, I, had, I had a great time. And the nice thing about my general surgery placement is that it never feels as if it's dragging. Like there's always enough stuff to do that by the end of the day, I look at my watch and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe the whole day's passed. And that's like a really nice, a really nice place to be in. Um, and it's got, I, occasionally there are days where the work feels a bit overwhelming, but then we've always got senior support if we need it. And, you know, if there's too much stuff to do and not enough time to do it, then you, you know, it's just about triaging appropriately and saying, okay, that can wait till tomorrow, that can wait till tomorrow, that's not urgent, we'll do that later and prioritizing the urgent thing. So that is, uh, a day in the life on the general surgery placement. I hope that was semi partially useful to people who are in medical school, maybe thinking of applying to medicine or maybe just interested in what happens as a junior doctor on a surgery placement. Um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, then please consider doing so. Have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.